Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to help you become a better ER nurse. Today, we're going over five key essential points every ER nurse should know. Hopefully, you're already familiar with these, but if you're not, that's exactly why we're here, to make sure you're fully caught up to speed and ready for anything that ER can throw your way. The first thing we're going to talk about is end tidal CO2 waveform capnography. End tidal CO2 refers to the amount of carbon dioxide exhaled per breath. By tracking this number breath per breath, we can assess how a patient is ventilating in real time. The normal value is 35 to 45. If the end tidal CO2 is reading between these, between 35 to 45, it means the patient's lungs are properly ventilating and exchanging gases. They're taking in oxygen and getting rid of CO2, and we can track this breath per breath with the end tidal CO2. Now, if the end tidal CO2 levels begin to rise, it means that the patient is not getting rid of CO2. They're retaining it. And this is going to be as a result of hypoventilation or they are just not breathing adequately, right? So if the levels are rising, it means they're not getting rid of CO2 and that they're not breathing adequately. If the end tidal CO2 levels are low, it either means the patient is breathing too fast or there is poor perfusion occurring in the body and the lungs are not getting the blood with CO2 for gas exchange. Again, it's either because they're breathing too fast or there's poor perfusion where the lungs aren't getting the blood, the perfusion with the CO2 blood for gas exchange. And remember, poor perfusion can be as a result of several things like shock or inadequate cardiac output. Some of the uses of end tidal CO2 are going to include during a conscious sedation. For example, medications such as propofol that suppress the respiratory drive are often given during conscious sedation. By having end tidal CO2, you can closely monitor for hypoventilation or, again, when the patient is not breathing adequately, which it can happen with propofol. So when it is detected, by a rising end tidal CO2 level, you can quickly intervene by stimulating the patient by providing a head tail chin lift and or providing oxygen administration with uh, a BVM, right? So again, with a conscious sedation, we can use end tidal CO2 to closely monitor the patient because if the end tidal level, if the CO2 end tidal rises it means that the patient is not breathing adequately they're hypoventilating and that signals us hey let's go do something about it stimulate the patient head tail chin lift or provide oxygen because a key point to remember is that the spo2 is not going to drop immediately when the patient stops breathing but if you have him on entitle the entitle co2 will immediately increase again the spo2 can take several seconds even a minute before it actually starts to drop when a patient stops breathing or isn't breathing adequately but the entitle co2 will immediately rise and this gives us the ability to closely monitor because we can intervene and act upon it immediately now, another use can be during CPR. During CPR, like you know, blood is being pumped to the body by chest compressions. It's being done artificially by the chest compressions. This blood that is pumped by CPR goes to the lungs, and we are able to measure the CO2 level from it if we have the end tidal on it. If the end tidal CO2 level is low, like less than 10, it can mean that the compressions are not effective because there's not enough blood reaching the lungs for us to check the CO2 level. And if so, measures can be taken to improve the CPR quality, such as ensuring proper rate, depth, and recall. For the entitled CO2, with CPR, we can also detect the return of spontaneous circulation. If the level suddenly rises or it goes to normal, or again, it just suddenly rises, it can, re it can be as a result of the heart contracting again and improving perfusion overall. So again, entitled CO2 helps with um, detecting return of spontaneous circulation because of the entitled CO2 number suddenly rises, it can signal that the heart's contracting again and helping perfusion. Also, 
Entitled CO2 also helps with decision making as to when to stop CPR and resuscitation efforts. For example, if the entitled CO2 remains low, it's been less than 10 or even zero for more than 20 minutes for 30 minutes, despite us making sure that the CPR is good, that we're doing all of our resuscitation efforts. This means that there's poor perfusion occurring everywhere in the body and the body is just simply not responding to our effort. So if it's been a prolonged time, where the entitled CO2 is low, this can help us decide that, hey, like we tried everything, CPR is good, we're resuscitating as we should, but everything's just not working, the body's not responding to it. It's another key point for us to look at when deciding to stop resuscitation efforts. And then other essential uses of entitled CO2 or monitoring patients after they received Narcan for overdose, again, this is just like with the conscious sedation, to assess immediately if a patient stops breathing for example you give the narcan the narcan wears off but whatever they were overdose on still taking effect and you're for whatever reason not in the room at least with the entitled co2 it's going to start beeping it's going to tell you hey come back into the room and you can keep a closer eye on it it's also useful for critical intubated patients as it helps gauge respiratory function and overall perfusion for the reasons that we talked about uh, super quick, if you want to continue mastering the essentials of emergency nursing, uh, just please consider checking out our book on Amazon. The link is below in a pinned comment. Now, let's talk about symptomatic bradycardia, where a patient may be experiencing symptoms such as dizziness, chest pain, shortness of breath, altered mental status, and hypotension. You're going to address the ABCs and keep at the back of your mind the cause of the bradycardia helping to identify the cause of the bradycardia is it because they took too much of their beta blocker or their calcium channel blocker is it as a result of an electrolyte electrolyte issue like hyperkalemia or can it be a STEMI right that's causing this symptom so address the abcs like you do for every patient if you need to provide oxygen provide oxygen and so forth so forth uh, but keep at the back of your mind what could be the cause of this now the first line treatment for symptomatic bradycardia is generally going to be atropine. It's going to be one milligram every 35 minutes up to a max of three milligrams. Do keep a note that atropine will most likely not work in heart blocks and it can actually worsen cardiac ischemia in STEMIs or MIs as a result of increasing the heart rate and ultimately increasing the oxygen demand on the heart. Now, if atropine is ineffective and the patient remains symptomatic, transcutaneous pacing or infusions of epinephrine or dopamine should be administered. If your patient is in a third degree heart block and the patient um, has a very low blood pressure and they're about to arrest, transcutaneous pacing should be started first, uh, especially if it's a third degree heart block, right? Now, let's... Let's talk about some of the antidotes for these, right? The antidote for a beta blocker overdose is glucagon. Just ensure to ask for Zofran as a glucagon can uh, cause nausea and vomiting. The antidote for calcium channel blockers is calcium gluconate. There are more advanced treatments uh, for these overdoses like high dose insulin and intralipids. Um, if the insulin is, is given, just ensure you monitor closely for hypoglycemia and that, you're, you, give, that you give the uh, dextrose before the insulin. Now, Let's go over how to calculate an anion gap in DKA patients. Simply, the anion gap helps us assess for extra acids present in the blood. In DKA, these extra acids are going to be in the form of ketones. For DKA patients, a point of care glucose should be measured every hour while on the insulin drip, and a chemistry should be repeated every four hours to assess the gap and the electrolytes. The gap is calculated by adding the bicarb, in the chloride together then subtracting from the sodium a normal gap is less than 12 but again the gap is simply just sodium minus chloride minus bicarb just to keep it simple now let's go over indications for uh, intubation in the er because knowing when to intubate a patient can be life-saving and is essential for providing effective emergency care the main indications include airway protection respiratory failure and impending deterioration of the airway and respiratory drive so for airway protection when a patient is unable to protect their airway meaning they can't prevent aspiration of blood or vomit or other substances due to the decreased mentation. Intubation in this scenario may be necessary. In this case, the goal is to prevent aspiration and ensure proper airflow by securing the airway with an endotracheal tube. 
As for respiratory failure, intubation is indicated when a patient is hypoxic or hypercapnic, despite us trying non-invasive interventions like high flow or BiPAP. Intubation is necessary and required to improve their respiratory status so that we can help with better oxygenation and ventilation as non-invasive things were uh, not sufficient for the patient. And another reason for intubation is impending, impending respiratory failure. If a patient is showing signs of severely increased worker breathing, such as the use of accessory muscles, a rapid respiratory rate, and fatigue, they are at risk of towering out and going into respiratory failure. Intubating these patients early on helps prevent further deterioration by supporting both oxygenation and ventilation before the situation gets worse. Intubation may also be necessary when airway compromise is imminent, such as in worsening anaphylaxis with airway edema. If you wait too long with these worsening edema patients if with anaphylaxis, the swelling can get so bad that the airway becomes fully obstructed and then and this makes it very difficult for the providers to actually place an ET tube and it increases the chances of poor outcomes. Super quick, now let's go over the steps of intubation. These, so the first is going to be preparing. This includes assisting with gathering unnecessary supplies, such as a BVM, suction, appropriate sized ET tube, laryngoscope, and the medications that will be used for sedation and paralyzing. Next is pre-oxygenation. This involves providing 100% oxygen for several minutes to ensure the patient will have oxygen reserves while the intubation occurs. This can be done with a non-rebreather mask or the BVM. After you position the patient appropriately for the um, provider's ease of intubation, RSI medications should be gathered. Um, these will typically be etomidate and succedocholine or rocuronium. So again, um, position the patient and gather the medications that are going to be used for the RSI. Ask your provider, hey, what meds do you want to use? Typically, it's going to be etominate or sucks or, or rock. Uh, just know that you're going to administer etominate before uh, before um, the sucks. Etominate is the sedative and the sucks and the rocuronium or the paralytics. Just know that as the nurse, you are going to closely monitor the patient while the procedure is happening. You're going to keep an eye on the blood pressure and the SpO2. And you're going to verbalize loudly and firmly when the SpO2 levels are beginning to drop because the providers will be very focused on placing the tube. They may not be looking at the monitor, looking at the patient, assessing the patient because they're focused on that task at hand. Your job is to communicate with the rest of the team, with the providers when the SpO2 levels are dropping. You do so firmly and loudly so everyone hears because if it is dropping they are going to have to stop what they're doing take the laryngoscope out and they're going to have to use the bvm to bag the patient because they're already paralyzed to bring the oxygen level back up to 100 percent once it's at 100 percent and then they can try again because the oxygen reserves are built up again now after the medications are giving the etominate the sucks or rock again the sedative and the paralytic the provider will insert the laryngoscope they're going to visualize the vocal cords and they're going to insert the et tube with the stylet through the vocal cords the stylet will be removed the cuff of the et tube will be inflated confirmation of proper et tube placement will occur by listening to lung sounds by using the end tidal co2 by assessing for chest rise and with the chest x-ray after the et tube will then be secured and will be connected onto a ventilator and if you've learned something recently while at work that may be helpful to other new ER nurses, please consider sharing it in the comments so that we can all benefit and help each other out. Thank you. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.